Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns forever and ever. Our God is a healing God. He's a mighty God. If you believe that, come on and give the Lord some praise everywhere out there in the atmosphere. Give God some glory. Amen. Amen. Come on, y'all. I know y'all know how to put your electronic hands. That's right, Mother Yvonne. Put your electronic social media hands together and give God some glory. Give God some praise. God bless you, Sister Suzette. Bless you, Mother McCrory. Bless you, Mother Yvonne. Good to see all of you out there tonight. I'm trying to get some more folks to come on in here. I see we started to gather around. Our, our theme tonight is we'll be gathering around the mountain. We'll be coming around the mountain. Uh, amen. Amen. So come on into this space and time and let's see what the Lord has for us tonight. What a blessing it is to be in not only God's presence, but to be in your presence on this evening. A happy belated uh, celebration to everybody. Listen, I know that we celebrating the nation's independence, but I celebrate my spiritual liberation, my godly independence. Thank God for Jesus and the liberation that happened on the cross, not just on the cross, but what happened when he got up from the grave. When he got up, we gained our independence. Amen. Amen. So come on in. Come on in, everybody. Give God some praise as you come in. Shout at me. Hey, you got my daughter out there. Hey, Sister Samantha, Sister Latrice. God, God bless you. Deacon Rollins. Amen. Good to see everybody out here online uh, tonight. Amen. Wonderful. Wonderful. Oh, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. Thank God for this unified front. So come on, let's give God some praise. Call on the name of the Lord tonight. You all know how we do it. Uh, we know that God has been good to us and we want to draw him into this space. Where is God? He is right where you left him. So let's use that drawing power and call on the name of Jesus and begin to bring high places down with our praise. Remember that praising God is our access. That's how we get to him from the outer courts to the inner courts into the holy of holies. We have to begin by praising him. Praising God pleases God. Pre pleasing God settles conflicts. Let me say that one more time. God, I praise you because my praise is pleasing to your spirit. And when I Play, when I praise you, you settle conflicts, any conflict, any confusion, anything that is upon my life right now. I know that my praise is like a bulldozer paving and pushing it out of my way so that I can get access to you. Sometimes I don't even understand that the enemy has left me alone because of my praise. So come on, let's call on the name of the Lord tonight. <clears throat> Give God a righteous praise. He has protected you. He has kept you. He has made a way for you. So he is worthy to be praised. We want to draw him in. We want him to be pleased with our sacrifice of praise because we want him to recognize how close we want to get to him. Our praise is our weapon of warfare. Come on, use your weapons tonight and give God glory. God, we thank you. We praise you. We honor you for being in this space and time with us tonight. God, we have one purpose and one purpose in mind, and that is to study, to show ourselves approved unto our God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. We've come together to learn of you, oh God. We've come together to hear a word from you, oh God. We've come together to work through the scriptures, to understand what it is that you're speaking to our hearts on this night. This is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Now, Lord, take out of me the stony heart and replace it with the heart of flesh. Mold these lips of clay. Lord, do whatever you have to do that I might be used as a vessel for your glory and someone may hear a word from you tonight. In Jesus' name, we give you glory. In Jesus' name, we give you honor. And in Jesus' name, we give you praise. Amen. Bless you, everybody. Amen. Good to see you, Sister Coretta. Amen. Welcome. Looking for you to come on into the building, Sister Coretta. We miss you. Come on back home, sister. Come on back home. Uh, listen, I want to deal with this tonight. We thank God for his presence tonight. I thank him for his presence in my life. Thank God for 
my church family. What a wonderful time we had in service on this past Sunday. What a blessing it was to be in fellowship with the people of God. Uh, it is a wonderful thing. Every time we come together, God just takes us higher and higher. They, they, the old song says, every round we go higher and higher. Amen. Uh, so, so listen, <clears throat> thank God for Lady McCrory. Thank God for all of you, our extended family across the cyber waves. Welcome to our Facebook family, our YouTube family, uh, whatever platform you might be leveraging to get into this space. We thank God for you. Uh, we are working through or traveling through the scriptures. This is, uh, it's funny, uh, the, the Bible uh, tells a story. The Bible tells a story. And bless you, Lady McCrory. The Bible tells a story that speaks completely on its own. Y'all know that? Uh, it The Bible can tell its own story, but you've got to open it up and you've got to, to read it, right? Uh, it's got its own drama. This, this thing here uh, <laughs> is full of drama. Uh, it's got its own plot. It's it's uh, it, it does. It's got its own flow. It does not uh, need a preacher to breathe life into it. You hear what I'm saying? Uh, it it doesn't need me to breathe life into it. Uh, it's it's not boring without the work of a preacher. It's it's not boring. It does not require a preacher to uh to bring it to life it's it's an amazing story uh that we have the blessing of of looking at chapter by chapter i, I just i get excited about it um and so here we are uh the children of israel we've been dealing with with exodus and we've been dealing with how god has brought the children of israel out of egypt uh an amazing story he has uh, brought them through the plagues uh, that he laid upon the Egyptians, uh, the terrible judgment of the firstborn. He's brought them through the Red Sea. He has provided for them in the wilderness. And he has brought them to this place, uh, chapter 19, uh, coming to the mountain, Mount Sinai, everything that they have gone through up to this point has brought them to Mount Sinai. So, so let's read uh, chapter 19 of the book of Exodus. Y'all ready to dig in? Let's, let's, let's jump in here. Let's get in here. Uh, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready to get in. I'm ready to get in. Uh, Exodus 19, a couple of verses uh, verses one and two says in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel camped before the mount. Amen. So the the children of Israel have now come to Mount Sinai. Three months it took them uh, trusting God to get to this place. And now they have finally arrived. Uh, it's it's interesting because, uh, well, let me let me hold that thought. I'm, I'm gonna hold that thought. I'm gonna hold that thought. Uh, they finally get to Sinai. They've seen the the deliverance from Egypt. They've received the guidance from the Lord all the way through, right on the route that they were supposed to take. Um, they they've seen the victory at the Red Sea. Uh, they've been given their daily provisions. Remember, we talked about this. Uh, thank you, Lord, for my daily bread, right? The daily provisions of food and water by his divine intervention. 
right? Uh, and they also gained victory over the Amalekites. We talked about that a week ago, right? So all of this has brought them to where they are. Now, what I find interesting is they finally get to Sinai. And if you think about the story and how it unfolds, they stay right here at Sinai for a good while, right? In fact, they're at Sinai all the way through the rest of the, the book of, of Exodus. They're, in fact, they're in, they're at Mount Sinai until we get to Numbers chapter 10. So they're going to be in Sinai for the next 57 chapters of scripture. So the next 57 chapters of scripture deal with the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. I want you to think about that. That means that there must be something significant. There must be something that God wants to do with them at Mount Sinai. At the all now, remember, they're on their way to the promised land. But from now through Numbers chapter 10, they're going to be in this place. They're not going anywhere. So God must have something that he wants to deal with. There must be something that God is doing at Sinai with the reason that they're there for so long. So they, the Bible says they camp there uh, before the mountain. Uh, so you think about, think about everything that has transpired before they got to, to Mount Sinai, right? Uh, everything that happened was orchestrated for them to get there. I'm, I'm taking my time on this part uh, because somebody is trying to figure out why you are still where you are. After all you've been through, after but remember, all that you've been through had God's work in it. You're on your way somewhere, but you're trying to figure out why you're still in this place. God must be trying to tell you something. But here's the thing. The Lord says that the, the beginning of their experience at Mount Sinai is the fulfillment of what God said all the way back in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 12. Remember, and I, and I, have, um, I have talked about this on a couple of occasions. It's, it's amazing how we keep referring back to Exodus 3. Uh, Exodus 3 and 12, the Lord says, and he said, certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be a token or a sign unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou has brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. You ought to look at somebody and say, you're still here because God requires service from you. Amen. Think about uh, think about what Sinai represents. Sinai was the was the place where where uh, Moses had his burning bush experience. Am I right about it? Sinai, the, the, the whole nation of Israel is is getting ready to experience. Some of what Moses has already seen before. Right. Think about that. So so if the children of Israel would meet God at the mountain. It's only going to happen because God had already shown Moses. Well, what do you mean? What are you saying? What I'm saying is that in this context, the people are not going to go any further than their leader. Mm. I just lost my connection here. Ooh, that's that's good. What happens when people try to get ahead of the leader? 
So God wants to take them through an experience that he has already taken their leader through. Here's something else. The, the site, the, the traditional site of Mount Sinai, if, if it looks like anything, it looks like a, a pulpit. Imagine uh, an oversized mountainous pulpit, right? This, this outcropping of a mountain out in the wilderness. Because I say that because God is going to preach one of the most dramatic sermons to ever be preached at Mount Sinai. You all know the story. So the reason they come to Mount Sinai is because they are going to receive of the Lord. They've, there's a word coming from the Lord at Mount Sinai. So let's read on. Let's read on. Uh, chapter, uh, Verse three, verse three of, of chapter 19. Hope you all are still with me. Uh, and Moses went up unto God. And the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, thus shall thou say to the house of Jacob, Take note, he called them the house of Jacob. Just park that. Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Do you see what's happening here? So, so Moses goes up to God. Uh, God called to him from the mountain. So Moses is led by God, by the Lord, right? Up the mountain to meet with the Lord as he had done many uh, uh, on occasion before. And God speaks to Moses again, right? Uh, and he's telling him what he's going to say to the house of, of Jacob. Notice that God gives a title to the children of Israel. Are you here? Are you with me? Uh, I don't recall. I got to go back and look at my notes if, if he had called them the house of Jacob. So this title is now associating the nation with, think about this, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This title is now associating Israel with the weakest and most carnal group of the patriarchs. Did you get that? Jacob was the weakest and the most carnal fleshly group tribe of the patriarchs. He calls them the house of Jacob. And so God is saying it at this point in their path and in their experience, they're acting more like Jacob than they are of Abraham or Isaac. Woo. I, I, I don't know if that hit you the way that it hit me, but I, I caught that. I, I just caught that. He says, you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel. He just called them the house of Jacob, the weakest and most carnal of the patriarchs. And this is what he says. He's he's reminding them. He says, you you've seen what I did to the Egyptians. So God is sending them a message. Watch this, because I told you all there must be something that God wants because they're going to be at the, uh, Mount Sinai for a while. There must be something for them to do. Right. So God's message to, to Israel through uh, Moses is about his purpose and destiny for Israel. Now, we're going to find out that this, this destiny is based on 
uh, what God had already did for them in their deliverance out of Egypt. Think about this. God says, uh, before I tell you anything that I'm getting ready to tell you, because you got to realize now we're getting ready. You are, Everybody knows what happened at Sinai. Sinai is where Moses gets the commandments, right? So God is getting ready to teach. God is getting ready to, to share law. He's getting ready to deliver law. So we're getting ready to talk about law. We're getting ready to talk about rules and talk about regulations. God is getting ready to, to tell them what they're supposed to do, but he's not going to tell them what God won't tell you what you're supposed to do without first reminding you of what he's already done. Woo! He, God is not going to begin to give you instructions. Uh, watch this, because first he had to deliver them. He had to pull them up out of the miry clay. Come on, talk to me, somebody. He had to deliver them. God is going to deliver you first before he puts you to work. And what he's going to do is before putting you to work, he's going to remind you of what he's pulled you out of. Right. So think about this. Think about God's love and care. His 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 love and care was shown to Israel already. So I've got before I give you rules and regulations, I've got to, he says with love and kindness, have I drawn you? Uh, he, he's got to draw you out with his love and his kindness before he puts you to work. He says, uh, he says, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bear you. Uh, he says, I put you on eagle's wings. Think of it. He, he put you, he says, I put you on eagle's wings. I can't see without my glasses. And brought you unto myself. I put you on eagle's wings and I brought you. Think about the strength of an eagle's wings. Right. Remember, uh, eagles an eagle, when they carry their young, eagles do not carry their young in their talons. That's not how they carry their children. They they put their young on their back. They tuck them in their wings. So the young eagles attach themselves to the back of the mother eagle and they're protected as they're carried off. Right. That means that if a hunter wants to shoot an arrow, the arrow has to pierce through the mother before it can touch. <laughs> Y'all need to hear me. You, I, I love this because he says, I bore you on eagle's wings. I brought you on eagle's wings. And he says, and the reason that I put you on my back and on eagle's wings is so that you can hold on to me. I, I love this. I love this. See, a lot of folks are looking for God to, to hold you and to keep you. But God says, no, I keep those who want to be kept. And if you want to be kept by me, you need to hold on to me. I, 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 I know I'm only a few minutes into this thing and I'm already excited. So think about this. Think about this level of deliverance. This level of deliverance was for uh, fellowship. God says, I brought you to myself. Isn't that what he says? Uh, he says, I bear you on eagle's wings and I brought you unto myself. So the reason why God has delivered you is because he wants fellowship with you. huh? He didn't deliver Israel so they could do their own thing. He delivered Israel so they could be his people. Am I right about it? He, in verse five, he says, so if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure to me. So God's intention for Israel was to be a special. Do you know? Do you not know that you are a special treasure? treasure to God. He wanted them to be a people with a unique place as a part of his great plan. He wanted them to know how valued they were. God wants you to know how much value, what great value you have in his eyesight. God's concerned about you. Huh? I love what if if I love what Paul said. Paul, if you look at Ephesians, 
Paul says something in the book of Ephesians. Uh, Paul, and I love because Paul, Paul wanted Paul wanted believers to know what great treasure they are or they were to God, and he prayed that they would know. In 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 uh, the book of Ephesians, verse eighteen, he says, "The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know." What is the hope of his calling? L l listen to how he says this. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. God has had me in this space where I, he has he wanted me to deal with the inheritance. I've been dealing with the inheritance on, on Sunday mornings uh, because we have to know what the promises of God are. There are yea and amen, but what does that mean? And this is, and all the way back in the book of Exodus, uh, God, is, wants, God wants Moses to send a message to the children of Israel, to the house of Jacob. Watch this, and, and watch this. God wants to use the house of Jacob, and he refers back to this because they were the smallest and the most inferior uh, house of God, house of a, a tribe of Israel, and he wants to use them to get the gospel spread to the globe, to the world. He used the weakest and the most fleshly of people to begin populating the earth with his word. I, I, come on, this is why he can use me. This is why he can use me with my little old trifling self. Huh? So he wanted me to know how much value uh, I have in his sight and how much he longs to to fellowship with me and 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 what great a concern he has for my life. And Paul was saying the same thing in the book of Ephesians, chapter one, and verse 18. So I wanted to just put that in your notes. Uh, and then we'll, we'll we'll let's let's get back to to this. So he says, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. A holy nation. So God is beginning to describe or define who this delivered people should be. Huh? He, his intention for the house of Israel is to be a kingdom of priests, people who carry the word of God, where every believer can come before God themselves and everybody can represent God to the nations. I'm going to use the least likely people to deliver my word to the nations. I, I love this. I, uh, Peter uh, reminds us that we are a royal priesthood. Isn't that right? Uh, first Peter chapter two, right? So anybody that's serving God, you serve God as a king and as a priest. Peter said he has made us kings and priests. Uh, in, in Revelations, he said he's made us kings and priests to his God and father. That's in Revelations chapter one, right? So God has already begun to define who the children of Israel are to be. They are to be a holy nation. God's intention is for them and for us, for you and I to be a holy nation, a nation and a people that is set apart be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. We are in the world, but we are not of the world because we are a holy nation. We are a royal priesthood. We are a peculiar people. We are a nation that is set apart to do the will of God. We are a, a peculiar, a particular possession of God, and we are fit for the purpose of God. And that's why all things work together because we are called according to his purpose. So Peter says, we're a holy nation, special people. I, you ought to tell somebody I'm special. I'm special. Wh why? So that we can proclaim the, the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That, that's Peter. Isn't it? A, I love the fact that it, all the way back in Exodus, he begins to unveil the description uh, of who we are supposed to be. He's starting to talk about the traits, the characteristics of a holy nation and how we should see ourselves. Uh, listen, I, you ought to have some pride in your belief in God. As God's people, we have to be set apart. We have to think differently than the world. Amen. He says, uh, 
These are the words that he will speak, that he told Moses to speak to the children of Israel. Now watch this. He says, all of this happens if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant. So you can only get all of these things if you're in the word of God. Huh? So now the word becomes critical. It's a critical component of your walk with God. Apart from, from knowing and doing God's word, remember God's destiny could never be fulfilled without the obedience of the people of God. And you can't obey what you don't know. Talk to me, somebody. So that means that the reason he planted them at Sinai is so that he could put word in them. He had to give them something to keep. That means that God was looking to establish his covenant, his agreement with the children of Israel. Now, remember this. God's covenant with Israel is greater than the law. Remember that God was going to issue the law. He was, del he was delivering the law, but the covenant was greater than the law. The covenant that God was going to make with Israel included the law. So the agreement that God was establishing, oh, somebody ought to get this into your spirit tonight. God wants you to come into covenant with him, right? Uh, and, and he wants you to understand that the covenant, your agreement with him is greater than any sacrifice because it's greater than any law. So the covenant with God included law and sacrifice. And so the choice to obey and be blessed or to disobey and be cursed was on the part of the children of Israel. So you have an option, beloved. I, I didn't stay there long enough. I, I pray y'all got that in your spirit. I pray you got it in your spirit. I see you out there. Um, let's, let, let's read on. Let's read on uh, verse seven. And Moses came. Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together. <laughs> this is, this is, okay, let me, let me read and come back. Verse seven of chapter 19, and Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. It, it just sounds funny saying it out loud, y'all. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I notice this. Now watch this. Verse nine. And the Lord said unto Moses, lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with thee. Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak to you that the people may hear when I speak to you. Hold that. And believe you forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. Now, this is really, really significant. Think about this. Uh, Moses laid before them all the words which the Lord commanded him. So the people, now you, they said, we're going to do whatever the Lord said. We're going to agree, right? Now think about this, the people, these same people, right? But not even 40 days later, they would be challenged to receive the covenant again after they heard all these terms and, and receive it again. And it, that's coming in Exodus 24, right? So Moses brings back the word of the people to the Lord. Moses now is doing what the Levites, what a, what a true priest would do. He was acting as an intermediary between God and the people, right? Now we have a situation where God is speaking audibly to Moses, right? He says that the people may hear <coughs> when I speak to you, right? So now he, God, is, God is putting Moses into a position of validation, 
right? So that the people would know that God was talking to Moses, all right? Uh, what I find hysterically funny is the people said, we're going to do, we, we agree with everything the Lord says and everything he has spoken, we will do. Because you all know that it's not far down the line that they are literally having an orgy. And here they're saying, we're going to do it. Isn't that like us? Isn't it amazing how we can receive a word from the Lord, a covenant word from the Lord in our minds, but not truly submit to it in our hearts? It's, it's one thing to receive the word. It's another thing to submit to it. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, verse 10, verse 10. How much time? Here? And the Lord said unto Moses, go look, that word was even a lot for my dog. And the Lord said unto Moses, go unto the people, sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. And be ready against the third day. Now, y'all heard that, the third day. And be ready against the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Now, this is, this is good stuff right here. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about. That's where I got the, the title. We'll be coming round the mountain. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you go not up into the mount or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come up to the mount. Let me stop right there. So several things are happening here. God is instructing Moses to tell the people to consecrate themselves. So now we begin the process of preparation. Consecrate yourself today and tomorrow. So God was getting ready to appear to Israel in spectacular fashion and God wanted them to get ready and before this could happen he's saying they have to prepare themselves hold that yeah hold that God tells Moses to, to, to set bounds for the people all around so so the 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 coming of God to Mount Sinai, was not permission for the people to go to the mountain and fellowship with God. The people had to keep their distance. They had to stay behind a, a barrier. And the, and, and the penalty for staying behind the barrier, for failing to, to stay behind the barrier, meant death. Be it a person or an animal, God says they were to be killed if they got too close. And He says it, He was basically saying anybody that got too close would be regarded as unholy to the point where they could not even be touched and they had to be executed with a stone or arrow. Now, that means that the God was commanding the people to kill anybody that came too close to the mountain. He said, set bounds, put restrictions there. If there's, if, Remember that we're dealing in the same scripture where only the priest could go into the temple, right? And the priest had to be prepared to go into the temple. Remember, we're going to get to that, right? They had to tie a rope around with a bell and, right? So uh, what, I, what I think is interesting about this is if, if you all are anything like me, 
if if there's anything basic to human nature, it is that we need boundaries, right? We we need structure. We need guideposts. We need boundaries. We need we need limitations, right? Because in setting these boundaries and providing this death penalty uh, for for going beyond or or breaching the boundary, God was showing Israel that obedience is more important than your feelings. The Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. Let me say that one more time. God was sending a message that your obedience was more important than your feelings. Woo! Talk to somebody, Holy Ghost. Your obedience is better than your feelings. So when your feelings, when your emotions cause you to want to do something outside the boundaries that y'all know where I'm going, you know where I'm going, you know where I'm going, right? Uh, so you think about, it. I don't doubt that there was some folk in the house of Jacob that felt like going beyond the boundary out of curiosity, huh? But they had to submit their feelings to the greater cause for obedience, huh? All right, I'm gonna leave that alone. I'm gonna leave that alone. Uh, so when the trumpet sounds long, so they're supposed to be looking for a long and extended sound of the trumpet, right? Uh, you can only come near at God's invitation and God's invitation was the sound of the trumpet. Y'all know what the New Testament says. So now here's the seed planted that God was calling them near, but they weren't going to come until they heard the sound of the trumpet. That was the invitation to come close, but stay within the bounds of uh, the base of Mount Sinai. All right. I, I'm, my spirit, I, I really want to go deeper into that, but I can't because I got to get through this thing. Let's 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 keep reading. I may I may come back to this. Let's look at verse 14 and, and Moses, verse 14 of, of chapter 19. Uh, 46. Woo. Uh, and Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people. And they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. Come not. So Moses goes down from the mountain to the people, sanctified the people. They washed their clothes. And he says, be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Why is that in there? The rest of the scriptures don't teach us that there is any uh, Inherent uncleanness in sexual relations with your wife. In this particular situation, God wanted the people to demonstrate their, their desire for purity by putting on clean clothes and abstaining, restraining the flesh, keeping it under subjection. He says, be ready for the third day. So the meeting with God, I found out, could only come on the third day. The third day, something significant happens on the third day. And he's saying anybody that tried to meet with God before the third day tried to come before God had opened the way. Isn't it amazing that God wants to use the third day for his greatest sermon? For the children of Israel, there's something significant about the third day here. I, I don't I don't want to dig too deep into that, but I just want you all to put that in your notes Connect that third day to what happens in the New Testament. All right. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. Let's look at uh, verse 16. Look at verse 16. Uh, and it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings 
and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. Verse 18. And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace and the whole mount quake. There was a huge earthquake. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake and God answered him. Can you imagine how crazy? I mean, think of, can you imagine if you could try, if you were a time traveler and you was able to go back in time and experience this spectacular moment? I, I don't even know what my courage would have been to see this thick cloud on the mountain, to hear this loud. And my question is, who blew the trumpet? <laughs> who, who blew the trumpet, y'all? Right? You, you know that the sound of the trumpet had to be a heavenly sound. It had to be a, a trumpet from heaven. That was so loud, the Bible says that everybody trembled. Everybody that was in the camp trembled. And the Bible says that Moses brought them out of the camp to meet with God. They stood at the foot of the mountain. Now, every he says the, the mountain was completely engulfed in smoke because God had descended upon it in fire. So the, it's the, the smoke. Uh, it was like the smoke of a furnace. The smoke ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And there was a great quake uh, uh, the mount quaked greatly. So earthquake, smoke, fire. I, I can't even imagine. I, yes, they trembled. Thundering and lightning and a thick cloud. These, these signs of power uh, was the, the validation of the presence of God. This was God talking. Everything must have terrified the people. Can you, I can't even imagine uh, being there to experience something like that, right? Uh, think about this. Beyond everything that you could see, hear, and feel, there was this blast, this loud blast of a of a trumpet sound, and it wasn't coming from the camp. It was coming from the sky. It was coming from heaven. That's why they was uh, freaked out, right? And and the Bible says that Moses led them right up to the barrier, right, so that they could see, smell, and hear everything. They could literally taste the fire that had engulfed the mountain, as well as feeling the earth shake. I can't even imagine. I, I, I'm talking about it and I can't even imagine, right? And then after all of this, the sound, the, the trumpet sounds, right? So, so verse 20 says that uh, Moses, so Moses is going up. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai, verse 20, on top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up. God came down and called, and Moses went up. God came down and Moses went up. I got to get out of here. And the Lord said to Moses, go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze and many of them perish. And let, so in other words, he was talking about people trying to do more than what was required of them. People getting curious. Y'all know them holy folks that want to go a little further and prove their muster uh, in the Lord. Uh, my anointing has qualified me to go further. Yeah, uh -huh. you end up dead going beyond what God has instructed you to go. But that's another story. Uh, the Lord said to Moses, go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the unto the Lord to gaze. And many of them perish. A lot of folks, the curiosity. Right. You know, the 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 the, the cell phone ministry. Right. Isn't it amazing how. Uh, people are are going to to concerts that's supposed to be a Holy Ghost movement of God, and and can't nobody even get into the spirit because everybody busy trying to record something on their phone. That's another conversation again. Uh, so, um, uh, so where am I? I'm at uh, verse twenty two. At, at verse twenty two, and let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, the people cannot come to Mount Sinai for you charged us saying set bounds about the mount and sanctify it. So this is Moses getting ahead of himself. Right. Verse 24. And the Lord said to him, get away, get down and thou shalt come up. 
thou and Aaron with thee, but let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses goes down and he spoke to them. So this is this is what I want to this is what I want to deal with. God tells Moses to go back down and warn the people uh, about respond or respecting the holiness of his presence on Sinai. That's where I was dealing with how uh, you can hear a word from the Lord, but not you can hear it with your with your ears, but not submit to the power and the holiness of God. Am I right about it? So he says, go down and warn the people. Uh, there are people who were acting out of rebellion. That would have acted out of rebellion, uh, out of out of curiosity, you know, whatever it is that makes you think that you can go beyond what the man of God said. Talk to me, somebody. Uh, this is what I mean when I say don't go further than your leader. That doesn't put limitations on you. That means that, that there is a process. There is an order of things. We must do things decent and in order. And God was setting order. Right. The glory and the greatness of God was not to be uh, subjected to uh, to to the scientific minds or the scientific inquiries. Right. Uh, or or a way for somebody to prove their 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 authority or their manhood by going beyond. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, just because God called Moses and Aaron didn't mean there was an invitation for the whole nation to come. There are certain places that God wants his elect that ain't meant for other people at this time. Talk to me now. This was in the Old Testament, right? Uh, so the, the, the whole idea is that Sinai was exclusion. Uh, Exodus 19 is a picture of the awesome fear that each Israelite must have felt at Mount Sinai. So it's, it's easy to think that this would inspire them to be able to live a holy lifestyle. Think about this. Think about the power and the magnificence of everything that happened. When you see all that stuff happen, that'll, that's a sign that you ought to obey God. Am I right? It's a sign that you ought to obey God. Ooh, I got to close out of here, right? Uh, I, I found out that uh, a lot of us today feel like we need to get more of the thunder and fire and trembling of Mount Sinai into people as a way of keeping them from sin. We want to preach the Mount Sinai religion, right? But think about this, as powerful as that was, not 40 days later, the whole nation was in sin, right? They were worshiping a golden calf. And, and all the power and the glory that happened on that mount that day, was forgotten about not even 40 days later. They were praising a golden calf as if it was the God that brought them out of Egypt. How soon we forget. One writer said uh, to be in awe is one thing, but submission of the will is another. Isn't it amazing how we can be in a service and, and the spirit of the Lord comes into the service and somebody gets filled with the Holy Ghost and, oh, God show had his way in service today. And you leave out with the same sinful nature that you walked in the service with. I'm talking good to somebody. I, the writer in Hebrews tells us loud and clear that under the new covenant, this is what I love. So a lot of people want to preach the, the Mount Sinai religion. The fire and the brimstone, the preaching out of revelations to, to scare you into living holy. But God says that's why he needed a new covenant. He, he needed a, 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 a new revelation. Huh? Uh, watch this, because uh, in, in Hebrews, there was a new covenant that came off a different mountain. Somebody ought to say Mount Zion. And God says in, under this new covenant, I've given you a new mountain. The mountain where Jesus, where the, where, where the power resides, right? Uh, so God is saying here that Sinai, Sinai was a representation of fear and terror. But God says through Zion, I've given you love and forgiveness. Fear and terror at Sinai, love and forgiveness. By grace, are you saved through your faith, right? Sinai was a dry desert and Zion is the city of the living God. Talk to me, somebody. Sinai brought with it fear and power in an earthly setting. But Mount Zion is heavenly and spiritual. At 
At Sinai, only Moses could come and meet God. <laughs> but at Zion, everybody's invited. Zion calls for the general assembly. Sinai had guilty men in fear. Zion has men made perfect. Woo! Sinai is part of the old covenant and Zion is part of, is, is, is the new covenant because at, at Sinai, Moses is the mediator. But at Zion, Jesus is the mediator. So you no longer need Moses. Talk to me, somebody. So Sinai was the old and Zion is the new. Sinai is ratified by the blood of animals. Zion as the new covenant uh, is ratified by the blood of Jesus. I'm trying to get out of here. Uh, Sinai was all about barriers and exclusion and, and Zion is all about invitation. Come ye all who labor and are heavy laden. Talk to me. So uh, that means that that means that that Sinai is about law and Zion is about grace. So so they needed to receive a word. They needed teaching from the Lord. When God has pulled you up out of the miry clay, he wants to put his word in you. But he says, don't come to Zion like you went to Sinai. He says, you need you don't have to be afraid of me. Put away your hesitation. He says, come boldly before the throne of grace so that you can obtain. Huh? He says there's much that we can learn from Sinai. Right. Because we learn of God's requirements to be holy. And that he, we learn all the things that we have to do before we can come to him. Preparation is key. You got to get ready to come before the Lord. To lay aside every weight and the sin that would so easily beset you so that you can run to him. huh? And so uh, just like at, at Sinai, there's things we have to do even today to come before the Lord. Y'all talk to me, somebody. I, I pray that somebody's got something out of this thing. I'm trying to get out of here. You got to receive the word of God. God pulled you up so that you can receive the word of God. You got to be set apart. God pulled you up so that he can set you apart. You have to be purified. You have to be cleansed. He brought you up so that he can clean you up, turn you around. Y'all know what the songwriters say, right? And he says, it's after the resurrection. You can only come after the third day. But you, but he also says, you've got to respect, respect the boundaries that God has put on us as people of God. We've got to bring our flesh under subjection, restrained from the flesh. And we must know that the God that you're coming to is a holy. Holy God, you can't come to him any kind of way. You, you listen, you have to prepare yourself to come before the Lord. We want, yes, he says uh, he'll accept you as you are, but know who it is that's accepting you. That's why you got to have this word. So as I, I'm, I'm trying to close this thing out. Uh, I think that far too many believers are operating under the influence of the fiery power of law. Hmm? And God says, uh, you need to come near to me under the, the, the blood of the sprinkling, the, the blood of the lamb. And, and and you're because you're justified by the blood, not under the curse. This is the the majesty of God. What you he said, you can come and find favor. You can come and find life. He said, I, I give you life and that more abundantly. Huh? You go from from death to life. From sinned to justified, because he is the justifier of those that believe in Jesus, believing on him, receiving salvation, 
obeying his voice, keeping his covenant. And then he says, you'll be kings and priests unto God and the Lamb. And then you'll be saved with all the power of an endless life. God, I thank you tonight for this word. I thank you for all those that hung in there, stayed with me to hear the conclusion of the matter tonight, because the conclusion of this matter is the beginning of the established covenant that you have with your people. I thank you for the Mount Sinai lesson. And I thank you for the Mount Zion liberation. I thank you for being covered under the blood of the lamb. And I pray, Lord, that through this word tonight, someone has a better, a greater understanding of what Sinai religion is and what Zion salvation is. This is my prayer tonight for every believer in Jesus name. Amen. Now, you all know that uh, there's no way that I can leave here uh, without giving someone an opportunity to be reconciled to God, to be covered under the blood, because the establishment of your relationship with Jesus Christ, which is who we're talking about, that is the Mount Zion experience. You will have a right and a privilege of being called kings and priests. But the process, as we talked about, to, to get there is given to us in uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I, I want to pray that prayer with you tonight, this prayer of salvation, this Mount Zion salvation. Just repeat after me, dear Lord, please forgive me for all my sins. I believe that Jesus is the son of God and that he was crucified and that he died on the cross and was buried. But on the third day, God the father raised him from the dead. And right now, Lord Jesus, I open up my heart. I accept you into my heart as my Lord and my savior. You be my God and I'll be your child in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Now, beloved, according to that prayer that you just prayed, you are saved. And don't you dare let anybody tell you different. I believe that a transformation is happening in you by faith in Jesus name. And so you will never be the same. Amen. Amen. Welcome to the kingdom, my brother. Welcome to the kingdom, my sister. Know that the Lord loves you and we love you too. All right. Time to go. I'm well past my time, but I pray that this was worth it for you. I did not breathe life into the word. This word has life all by itself. Amen. It was as good to me as I hope it was for you. But listen, seed time before harvest. Let's seed into the kingdom. The Lord will bless you in giving. You cannot beat the Lord giving no matter how hard you try. So let's seed into the kingdom. Let's plant a financial seed so that we can continue to reach the masses through the work of the ministry. Uh, Cash app, it's on the screen below me or Givelify, whatever platform you use. I know the Lord will bless you in doing so. God, I thank you and I praise you for the gift and the giver. Lord God, show them your might, show them your strength, show them that you will keep them uh, because of their commitment to you, not only keeping the word, but planting seed into the kingdom. Bless him such as your riches and glory, and we'll give you honor and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Thank God and amen. Now, beloved, we got to get out of here. May the Lord bless you, protect you, and keep you until we come together on the next Lord's Day where we can travel through the scriptures. All the people of God can shout with a loud and thunderous voice. I thank the Lord. I thank the Lord. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time on Traveling Through the Scriptures. Thank you.